Okay. Um, has anyone got any questions or re brief reflections? Anything you'd like to ask? I've got a question here. Can we grab a microphone? Maybe just let us know where you're from as well when you ask your question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Corinne. I'm from Cairns um, and involved in climate activism. I just wonder as scientists how frustrating it is to know and not have um, appropriate responses. And if you are inclined and if you do do civil disobedience and if you think it's a necessary thing to do. David, I might throw to you first. Um, frustrating or not? Um, so <clears throat> I've been involved as a climate scientist in sort of both understanding and action on climate change for more than 40 years. Uh, is it frustrating? I see it. I have a very glass half full perspective. I see it as opportunity. And if you like reinforcement of the need for me to be out there trying to improve climate literacy amongst communities. So for some people, it's depressing. For me, it's empowering, which may seem weird, but many people have called me weird in the past as well, including people who are climate change deniers. They describe me as weird. So no, I see it as empowering. I am just a weird person. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what the, I guess, is it frustrating? Um, yeah, well, yes, I just sang a, a song to get my frustrations out. So yes, yes, I think it is frustrating. Um, but I, I guess um, it's, it is a, it's important to, um, uh, like, I guess, recognise that everybody is different and everybody has different ways of communicating and everybody holds diff like different values dear to them. Um, there are some core values that unite us all as human beings. So I guess it's, some, it's, a, it's important to always bring conversation back to those um, and, and that, you know, this is a, um, about, it is a, in, in essence an existential crisis faced by all humanity. So, um, and the enormity of the, of the challenge can be overwhelming and also very traumatic, particularly for, um, I find, working with traditional owners, um, particularly when you, um, uh, when I am talking with traditional owners about climate change, there's, um, a, a lot of trauma there too, that, that, uh, at, at discussing that because you're talking about the, yeah, like, um, really, really difficult things that are difficult to, to talk about and difficult to face. Um, so I, I think that's the, that's the challenge. Um, in terms of the role of civil disobedience, I think, you know, there's people take action in different ways and, and we've definitely seen a rise in civil disobedience um, around the world. Um, but I think it takes, you know, that there needs to be conversations um, about, you know, everyone needs to come together to take action. So, um, uh, you know, that everyone has a role to play in, in that and um, it needs to be a conversation. It is empowering. I have a voice and people listen to it. I can publish, I can speak publicly, I can you know, make statements, make authoritative statements about what is actually happening in this world. And that's very important that we have people who have that voice. The hub is all about climate systems, hub is all around joining together. So including you, including the general public. Sometimes it's frustrating when we have to join together to face a challenge and some people don't get out of the way. Of course, that's frustrating. It's like trying to get on the tram and people differing in front of you or something, but um, civil disobedience. Uh, no, I'm much more subversive than that. I'm going to change the world from the inside. Also, historically, as we know, civil disobedience has had a huge place in political movements grassroots and bottom-up system change has been the driver for some of the biggest changes that we've seen in the world so far and then top-down system change has a result of that so I'll keep it short. Okay. All right I think there's another question down here. Hi I just wanted to ask Tiani in particular um, just for a very quick update on the um, 
Islander people and their case to the UN and where that's up to. So we've got a lot happening in the Torres Strait at the moment. We've got sea claims, we've got native title claims, and we've got the case of the UN trying to go forward at the moment. It's all in progress. And um, Uncle Yassi is having a, uh, a big go around that at, at trying to get that sort of movement happening in, happening in terms of understanding that this is a human rights issue, not just a climate science issue, that it's actually a, a huge population affecting global changing devastating time that we're in at the moment and so everything's in motion but as for having results we're still waiting just like our um, native title claims and sea claims so question up the back and then one over there as well Thank you. And thanks, Tiani, for such a solution oriented talk. Um, Rebecca Spindler from Bush Heritage. I just wanted to ask you something, and I know that it may include intellectual property. So if you can't tell me, don't don't answer. But I, I thought your solutions were really great for mitigation, and that's clearly required. There are some, there are going to be some impacts that are baked in that are going to be continued to see. Are there solutions? What does the community feel is a viable solution to that adaptation in the in the short to medium term if we can turn that, you know, get the mitigation solutions in place to turn the, the carbon emissions around? In terms of seaweed or climate in general? No, so the impacts that you're already seeing from the sea from the ocean level rise. Yeah. So what are culturally relevant viable solutions for these communities before that, you know, while we're still going to see those impacts coming? Yeah, absolutely. So renewable energy has a huge place in com community and changing the way that we can source what we get our power for from sorry often in communities the government will put things like diesel generators in and create a, a reliance on a system that is super detrimental to the environment so there's those just transitions we can have to renewables and there's some first nations focus industries and companies as well that do that the government at the moment are putting in bags full of sand <laughs> to help mitigate risks of the sea level rise and basically as quickly as they can put these bags of sand down is as quickly as they get washed away so it's not really a solution at all we need to look at the structures and systems that we have around food and changing the ways that we create like you said not just mitigate but create these carbon emissions in the first place obviously in terms of agriculture a different solution is let's all transition to a plant-based diet. That's not going to happen for everyone. There's also issues, health issues and things like anemia for certain people who might not want to rely on everything. Everyone has different ideals about uh, food and as you know, increasing to a higher plant-based diet would help that, but not entirely change the problem at scale in itself. We've still got this massive billion dollar industry that relies on these systems. So in talking about changing like just transitions to renewables, talking about the way that we manage water. There are so many solutions that Paul Hawkins speaks about, but improving our fisheries and the landfill methane producing waste that we produce as well. When we chuck anything into the ground, all of our rubbish, we create more methane there as well. So looking at the way that we change the way that we manage our waste uh, and the capture of that, we can have net zero buildings, we can create buildings uh, that are urbanized with plants and not just green for drawing down carbon but also that feed us so we can change the way that we utilize and manage land down in South Australia we've cleared 91 percent of our natural flora for agriculture which is ridiculous it creates a really really hot arid environment where obviously native flora and fauna don't thrive and then we also create really toxic unhealthy soils that can't regenerate we're not putting back any of the uh, nice microbes back into the soil that need to be there either so yeah lots of different solutions and lots of different ways that we can manage that in terms of communities at the moment the thing that we're most focused on is renewable energy and changing the food systems and the way that we manage our waste because often as well we're not given the same ways of recycling or means of recycling say when if you've been to apy lens they don't have recycling bins or they'll get given a bin but not given an actual recycling unit so it just ends up going into landfill anyway i think you would be able to add on to that though more 
I'm not the adaptation expert, but um, it's insidious what's happening in the ocean. And I said earlier this morning, global warming is ocean warming. And part of the sea level rise story is the thermal expansion of the ocean. And as Tani was saying with the bags of sand, in many cases, you can't fight it. It's, you know, what, what we're facing. But, um, you know, we can mitigate a lot through choices about how much. And we saw a nice movie on that, what the difference is for those people who are, you know, living closest to those communities, even countries, islands, closest to sea level, um, how all our choices joining together can affect the outcome of the impact on those communities. Uh, in many cases, it really is just insidious. The power of the ocean is too much. And you know, on sandy shores, a metre of sea level rise is going to be 100 metres of encroachment. And, uh, Places like Florida, it's going to come in underneath and come up through the, even if you build a seawall, it's still going to get under and come up through the drainage systems. Some yeah. things we can't fight, some things perhaps we can. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. One up the back. I'm from South and Bangala, Bangala country and Port Lincoln, not far from Coffin Bay. Um, a lot of South Australia is actually um, under sea level, especially air, uh, Lake Air. So that, that's um, another area that could come into some trouble up the track possibly also. Um, I'm, all, I'm all for um, scientists being independent and being not controlled by a boss or someone that, like a CEO who dictates, similar with government, we need some kind of independent watchdog over, over government as well so we can actually get real science with critical thinking from both, both angles. And on that note with the... Um, the big fossil com fossil fuel companies too. There's hydrogen on demand systems as well, which aren't that complicated. They're complicated, but that, you know, someone with with a little bit of mechanical knowledge could quite simply build one and run a car on salt water, or even diesel can be run on salt water. And also, our plastics can be made in a system in a container that has the um, oxygen taken out. So, in a vacuum of sorts, with no oxygen, fossil fuel can be the plastics in, in the fossil in the fuel can be reverted back to petrol. So we can um, turn our waste back into fuel and hopefully go to hemp in the future as another way and possibly bamboo. So there's a lot of solutions out there. I think a lot of the time it's those with dollar signs in their eyes and that love money before the earth and humanity are the problem. Right. I might take that as a comment, I think, unless anyone wants to comment no thank you that's that's really helpful um mark up the back i think um uh, thanks thanks john um j just a a quick comment actually following on that past past one about critical assessment um so tiani i really love your solutions focus and i share that uh, but one of the things we have to do in the solutions is make sure we don't make the other problems worse through through what we do and that's why uh, being critical in our approaches, being a collaborative and consultative in our approaches is really important. Now, one of the challenges here is with the um, red seaweed is that there are actually a whole stack of questions about the effectiveness, the environmental impacts of that, uh, the animal health, human health and supply chain uh, risk issues associated with that, which seem to have got omitted because everyone's hyped up and really racing to this apparent solution. Um, but just a, a note of caution uh, in relation to that, there's actually a lot of work that needs to be done before, in my view, that this should get the tick for moving forward. And there are other solutions which don't have those negatives, which we think, I think we should be really prioritising. Tiani, would you like to respond? Yeah, for sure. So I said before about working in the space of the production and the research, the community consultation, but also in bringing that into the agriculture system. So we have cattle trials with that happening already that have been um, ongoing for a few months now, which are having really positive effects. We've had trials all over the world in different parts. Obviously in the sciences and in the world, people are going to sometimes agree and sometimes not agree. And I understand that there's different ways of looking at things. Bromoform is the compound within asparagopsis that we're looking at. It has a synergistic relationship with asparagopsis. So for the best methane mitigation it needs to be put together you can't just extract synthetically producing uh you can't just extract and synthetically produced bromoform it needs to be together with the seaweed 
but we've seen up to 98% reduction in, in cattle, which is incredible and a potentially global changing solution. So obviously there's some things that are more for some people important or more of a priority, which I totally understand, but this is the space that I'm working on in seaweed and methane mitigation in agriculture. And we're seeing some great results from it. We've had the minimum um, test results that we've had so far is 80% methane reduction, which is still a global changing solution for climate change. So there's gaps and it's a work in progress, but we're doing our best with what we've got at the moment. And I think back to some comments before about, about in terms of what do we do separately to the seaweed, First Nations land care management is incredibly important and being able to uplift our communities with the resources that they need probably in terms of money, not the knowledge, obviously we already hold the knowledge to be able to look after country and care for country. That's incredibly important. We speak about sustainability. We don't do sustainability anymore. We're continuing to damage the earth at an exponential rate. We used to live sustainably where things would go back into the earth and regenerate. Now we're just on like a slow decline. So we don't do sustainability anymore. What we need is regeneration and they're the types of solutions that we need to look at now. That sounds that point sounds like a really good point to finish on, I think, for today.